Welcome back to The Practical Woodsman. I'm Rut, the creator and host of The Practical Woodsman. That's right. It's my genius which has brought this all into existence. In this episode, I want to talk about different shelter options, go over the pros and cons of the different types, and talk more about the incredible importance of factoring mobility into your philosophy of preparedness with any shelter, the ability to move to not be confined to just one area, which is a mistake a lot of bush, bushcraft type people make, don't they? They're, they're building these shelters, uh, take some weeks to build, and they think that's just where they're going to stay and there's not going to be any problems with that. Well, we'll talk about why that maybe that's not uh, the most practical approach to things. Also, uh, I'll try to fit a campfire story into this episode of the podcast if I can but first we have to do the musical introduction to get us all in the mood for this stuff so stick around I'll be right here when that's over Hello again, everybody. I want to thank you for joining me. I hope you're all doing well out there. I wanted to tell you a couple of announcements, then we'll get into our discussion for this episode. Locals, that's where my online community is, my exclusive The Practical Woodsman online community. And you can join us there by going to thepracticalwoodsman.locals, L-O-C-A-L-S dot com in your web browser. Or another way you can do it is you can just download the really nifty locals.com app from the app store and then just search for the practical woodsman within i do uh live streams there on saturdays uh, when i can and it's been kind of hit and miss but uh, when i do get to do them it's fun it's very informal i show off different preparedness gear backpacking gear uh, wilderness gear bushcraft gear and uh, things of that sort in a really informal setting. So uh, it's kind of nice, and you guys can interact with me while I'm doing that. Uh, I wanted to tell you there's several different show types that I do. So for those of you who are only subscribed to the audio version of this show, this podcast, you're missing out if you like my content. Uh, The other show types are, of course, adventures. That's just me in in the woods. And then I do a show type that's called Exclusives, and uh, that's where I need video. I really need video to be able to show off whatever I'm showing off. I just did, uh, so, you know, for example, if you're just subscribed to this podcast, the audio version of this podcast, you've missed three podcast-type things that I've done since this last the last episode because they were only conducive uh, for video, I showed off some tents. I showed off some nifty tricks and uh, interesting things uh, that you can implement for your bug out bags for your time in the woods. Uh, so, if you'd like to see those sorts of things, please subscribe to the Practical Woodsman on either YouTube or Rumble. Of course, I'm particularly particularly fond of Rumble because of I never have to worry that I might say something that's not in fashion and get censored or deplatformed or any of those things. So I'm 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 partial to rumble, but uh, I will admit readily that the majority of my audience comes from YouTube. Um, let's get into our discussion today. Pros and cons of using the what what are the different shelter types. The, the primary different types of shelter types that we're going to talk about today. Well, my philosophy is always ma- uh, keeping mobile. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I had a guy mocking me on, I think it was, I think it was on YouTube, mocking me 
a few weeks ago because I had said that I had watched the movie uh, World War Z with Brad Pitt, and uh, he mentions in there, he he plays this guy who's very um, familiar with natural disasters and stuff like working in these war zones and stuff like that. And in the movie, he states how important it is to, to stay mobile, that typically it's people who are able to be mobile who do better in those sorts of situations. And this old fella got on YouTube and started mocking me. How ridiculous I am for getting my wisdom from a movie. Well, I didn't get my wisdom from a movie. It's just that the movie reflected wisdom that I had already picked up in other places. I was just using the movie to illustrate uh, the the importance of mobility. But we'll, we'll get into that discussion here in a little bit. Um, let's talk about backpack and tents. So the different types of things that I've got in mind for uh, the woods, for being mobile, for backpacking, uh, for your bug out bag, uh, are backpack and tents. These are the main ones that I can think of. You, you guys might think of something else like bivy sacks and stuff like that which I'm not going to consider today, but the ones that are on my mind anyway are backpack and tents, tarps, and natural shelters. Like these would be like things that you would build, right, in the natural woods, uh, out of natural materials, just things you find in the environment. Let's talk about backpack and tents. What are some of the pros of them? Well, they, they provide you protection from the elements, There's actually another one, uh, another shelter type that we're going to talk about right toward the end. I won't mention it now because I kind of want to save it for uh, special emphasis toward the end of the show. But let's get back into backpack and tents. They they provide you protection from the elements. Of course, that's the whole reason for any shelter at all, ain't it? Protection from elements. Rain is an element. (laughs) Wind is an element. Um, You know, wind uh, is so, I think, underestimated by so many people, especially if you don't have a lot of experience with these sorts of things. You're just kind of imagining what scenarios you might find yourself in and trying to create a bug out bag or or pack a backpack like maybe you're going on your first backpacking trip. Uh, You know, the, the primary thing everybody thinks about is rain. Of course, there's snow, um, dew, which, by the way, if you get up under some trees, low with trees with low branches, the dew doesn't affect you. I told that to a feller one time in um, Philadelphia. He was talking about worrying about waking up with dew on him. And I said, well, we get up underneath those trees there. They got kind of the low branches uh, we won't have to worry about waking up with dew on us. And he kind of thought I was stupid. He says, well, you know, it's not like rain. Dew forms in the air. That's true, but as anybody who grows up in the woods knows, as I did, is that for whatever reason, and I can't give you the, the scientific explanation for it, but for some reason you get up under trees with low lying branches, and uh, the dew doesn't fall there. I guess the explanation would be this. Dew does materialize in the air, but it rises. And then it has to fall and settle. So if you're up underneath a tree with branches, when it falls and settles, it settles on the branches and on the leaves and not on top of you. I would say that that makes sense, wouldn't you? But he thought I was crazy because I said if you get up under some trees... You won't wake up with dew on you. And and that's true. It, it, all of you who come from backgrounds like me will attest to this. But anyway, elements. Backpack and tents protect you from those things. But another thing that a backpack and tent is typically used for is fear of insects. Now notice what I did not say. I did not say protection from insects. I said protection from the fear of insects because I think that's more what it's based on. All of my life, 
I've been sleeping right on the plain old ground, not enclosed in anything. And as far as I know, I have never been bitten by an insect greater than a mosquito. I mean, I might have rolled over on an ant or something like that or had a, a spider scuttle across the top of my blanket or something like that, but it's not the problem that people imagine it to be. It's mostly in people's imaginations. I wonder how many of you out there could also attest to this and back me up on this. So <clears throat> the comfort of being enclosed in a tent where you're fully enclosed, you've got a floor, uh, you know, you can zip yourself up in there and be completely closed off from insects and stuff like that. Comes down more greatly, I think, to emotional uh, or even psychological comfort more than actual need. Need of protection from insects, snakes, and those sorts of things. Now, I'm not saying that there's never been a person who woke up with a, a rattler in their sleeping bag or anything like that. I'm sure it's happened. It just ain't very common. I have this, uh, well, it's a TP, it's a floorless TP tarp shelter. Uh, it's called the Black Diamond Megalite. My favorite tent, I believe, I've ever owned. It's also the simplest. As you just stake four corners, pull up the middle, and there's your shelter, and it, it'll fit for four full-grown men, packs down to just like a football size. Let me see if I can get it to show those of you who are watching the video what the size of that that tent, uh, tent tarp, I, I reckon you'd call it. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's a four-man tarp tent, TP tarp tent. It's made out of sil nylon. Uh, those of you who are watching can see it's about the size of a football. That's all there is to it. Size of a football. Spread. I'll show. You, I'll show some images on the screen too, of this thing pitched, but it'll fit four full-grown men. Um, my point is that it's floorless. And fifteen years of using that thing in rattle timber rattlesnake country during timber rattlesnake season. Sleeping right there without, it, it, the thing is, is around the bottom of it, there's a space. So anything that wants to come in can. I, I once, uh, sleeping in that shelter, had a porcupine try to come into my tent. And uh, most docile porcupine I, I've ever seen in my life. Just curious. And I, you know, I kind of roused to awake and... Uh, turned on my flashlight and it was a porcupine just kind of poking his nose up underneath my tent but never snakes never had any trouble with snakes never had any trouble with insects knowingly like I said I might have had one crawl over top of me or something but I was asleep didn't bother me and I didn't bother it now I will tell you there was an experience I had in rattlesnake area a rattlesnake area a few years back it was late in the year. It, it was getting cold. And I thought it was too cold, really, for snakes to be active. But I had gotten my uh, campfire going one night. I was sitting by the campfire, and my dog kind of alerted me to something moving uh, in the woods. And I got up and took a look, and, and it was a, a big old beefy timber rattlesnake. And I think what had happened was it sensed the heat of my fire and was coming for the heat of my fire. And I had my, I was carrying a tent on that occasion, an, actually in, an actual enclosed tent, but I had the door wide open. So I did have that experience, and you know, your imagination plays with that and says, well, what, what if you'd been sleeping, like next to the fire, and this rattlesnake come sliding right up next to you? Well, what if? Unless you're just a really, you move a lot in your sleep, I reckon it could be a problem, but uh, I'll tell you, maybe, maybe I'm pressing my luck, but I do it all the time. Sleep right out in the open next to my campfire. 
and I've it's never been a problem. So anyway, my point there is that with backpacking tents, I think a lot of folks prefer to carry that extra weight uh, and be and know that they're going to be completely enclosed in a tent because of protection from their fear of insects, not so much protection from insects. So another pro of backpacking tents, enhanced privacy and security. You know, it's that sense of security. Uh, another one is easy setup with pre- pre-attached poles. You know, this tent I just got done showing you, or this tarp I just got done showing you, this black diamond megalite. It's so com- compact and light. Uh, but once you add stakes, once you add a center pole, uh, it gets to about the same weight of like a, an ultralight backpack and tent. You know, you're not going to have the space within an ultralight backpack and tent that you have in this sucker. I mean, you, you feel like you're living inside the Taj Mahal when you're inside this thing. I mean, it rains and I've got a backpacking chair or something. Uh, I can pull I can pull everything right into the tent with me and keep it dry and keep it under under the shelter like that. You can't do that with an ultralight backpack and tent. But, you know, there are pros and cons to both things, and that's kind of what we're talking about here, ain't it? You know, one thing I, I often did with this black diamond megalite is I wouldn't take a center pole. What I would do is I would uh, procure or make my own center pole once I got out into the back country. I'd just take out my hatchet or my belt knife. I would try to find an old tree, an old sapling or, you know, a dead sapling that I could use for my center pole. And if I couldn't, I would get down into a big grove of saplings and cut myself one down. And then I would use that as my center pole. And then I would continue to carry that throughout the rest of the excursion so as to not be chopping down a, a live tree at every camp that, that I stopped at along the way. Uh, so that would save a little bit of space and weight. But it's awfully nice, ain't it? With a backpack and tent to just have poles there. And that's really what I was getting at. Was that the, the ultralight backpack and tent and this black diamond megalite, weight-wise and space-wise end up about the same except that my black diamond megalite tarp tent will fit four full-grown men it's offers all kinds of space the, the ultra light backpack and tent doesn't do that backpack and tents are often lightweight and compact not too hard to transport uh, they provide a defined living space now what i want to say about that is that i've got i'm going out here in a couple weeks on a big excursion about a week-long excursion and i've kind of decided i think this time i'm i'm seriously considering taking an actual backpack and tent to be enclosed inside the tent now is that because i want to be comforted from my fear of insects or snakes or anything like that no the reason why i'm considering taking a backpack and tent an actual tent, enclosed tent, on this trip is because it's spring. It's the rainy season here where I'm at. And so I, I'm suspecting highly that for many of the days, there's going to be the potential for a lot of wetness and rain and that sort of thing. And what happens when you're like in a floorless tent or something like that, of course, I take a tarp, I put the tarp down, and I'm sleeping on the tarp. But when you've got all that open space with underneath a tarp tent or a, a TP style floorless thing is that you move around a lot. You know, I'm moving around, I'm working, I'm doing things within the shelter and uh, inevitably you end up moving off your, your ground tarp or your, your blankets shift off the, the tarp, they touch the ground and of course when they do that they get wet Things can be muddy, uh, so, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to not get mud on your gear when you're in conditions like that. So, for me, really the draw or the, the thinking that I have for taking a tent on this particular excursion is to keep perf- a perfectly dry area so I can 
get up underneath the vestibule, leave my boots out outside the tent, keep my bags, gear, those sorts of things outside the tent, but then get inside the tent and have this perfectly dry enclosed area with a defined living space. Now the nice thing about, and here's another thing I'm thinking, is that uh, I'm not taking a sleeping bag on this trip. Back during the winter time, I had done a test, and so a lot of you might have seen it, where I bought like three down throw blankets for about $50 each. I actually, I, thought, I think I paid less, $25, $20 each for them. And uh, my argument was that those insulate as well if, if you layer them up. They insulate just as well as any $800, 800 fill goose down sleeping bag from Marmot. So you're saving, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars and getting the same quality insulation for, you know, a hundred bucks, 120 bucks. So I had done that video and I did a test. Well, this is going to be the real world test. So we're looking at lows in the evening where I'm going to be heading in a lows in around the 20 degree Fahrenheit mark. Let me see what that is in, in Celsius for you folks who got to make everything complicated. Okay, so we're looking at like minus two degrees Celsius at night where I'll be where I'll be going. I want to try out these down blankets, which pack down to like the size of a Nalgene bottle. Take a very little space, and I'm just going to layer them on top of me and uh, cross my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and hope that uh, that my theory really pans out. But if you think about me being underneath a floorless tarp tent, TP tarp tent, having all these blankets on top of me, they're going to shift in the night. They're going to be moving all over the place and be down on the ground falling off of me and stuff like that. So if I take a, a tent that I'm enclosed in, it'll keep everything together. So when I'm in the tent at night, it's a one-person tent is the one that I'm thinking of taking. When I'm in the tent at night, me and my dog, that tent, because of its enclosed nature, is going to keep everything in place while I'm sleeping, while I'm covered up with these multiple blankets. But that is also a big, it's a really big pro of, of a backpacking tent is that it kind of keeps you tucked in, doesn't it? tucked in keeps everything there in place it, it can't go they can't go anywhere the, these things so they just kind of stay in place and that's my purpose for my plans to take a, an actual tent on this upcoming trip now here's some cons of backpacking tents they can be heavier than other shelter options i know one person tents are kind of out of fashion Right now, I don't understand it because I, I think they're awesome. And I mean, basically what I'm doing in my shelter is sleeping. That, that's, I want to be out enjoying the woods while I'm awake. So basically when I crawl into my tent, it's to sleep. I might read for a little bit or, you know, I might get this huge downpour and have to jump into my tent. But still, I'm just lying there reading or something while the rain is going on. So... I personally really love one-person tents. I think they look cool. I think they, they're they certainly lighter than other tent options. I think they serve their purpose. They don't add any unnecessary things. But they're not very popular right now. Even among people who consider themselves ultralight backpackers, what I notice, everybody wants to carry two-person tents, even if they're just one person. So if you're going to do that you know, that, that adds that adds significant weight, even if you're an ultra lighter. Another con is uh, completely enclosed tents offer limited ventilation. Of course, we're talking about everything being relative here, right? They offer more limited ventilation in comparison to some other options, certainly to a tarp, right? And that can lead to condensation, of course, you get up in the morning, you're trying to head out on foot, and it feels like, you know, you, you've done it, right? You take the tarp off, or you take the uh, rain fly off the top of your tent. It was as dry as a bone all night, but that rain fly feels like it's drenched 
in rain, doesn't it? It feels like it's just been raining on the inside of that thing all night long. And you got to hang it and dry it out before you pack it away. And yeah, it kind of sets, sets, sets you back on your time. You can get back on, on foot. These enclosed backpack and tents are usually more expensive compared to a lot of other options. Now I will say this black diamond mega light, which I bought, you know, at least 15 years ago. Uh, and man, I really, I just love it. But I think I paid like $300 for it at the time. And that's about what a really highfalutin name brand tent, uh, ultralight tent will go for these days. These days. So I can't imagine what this $300 sil nylon tarp, uh, what that $300 would be in today's terms. But on in general, in general, an enclosed tent is going to be more expensive compared to other options <clears throat> you folks who haven't seen those exclusive videos i did last week really need to check those out i i reviewed two um, budget tents from amazon one from featherstone and another from uh, idugan one was a two-person tent and the other one was a, a one-person tent they are both excellent tents excellent at right about a the hundred dollar range you guys really want to Guys and girls, by the way. When I say guys, I'm talking to guys and girls. But uh, you guys really want to check out those videos if you're in the market for for a really quality tent, either two-person or one-person. Another con, uh, they're vulnerable to damage from sharp objects. Ain't that true? They've, got a, they've really got a finite life. So you spend $300 on a highfalutin full enclosed tent and uh, they, they've got a finite life the poles will break after after a certain amount of use uh, any of us with any experience in these sorts of things knows that these things are true and of course they get outdated something better comes along another con is that uh, they require a level ground for pitching uh, a couple of buddies that I always take with me on my excursions Always complaining about that. Always trying to find a level ground because if you don't, let's say that uh, you wake up, uh, you're on a hill where you do not find a perfectly level spot, uh, you'll slide down toward the bottom of the tent or you'll slide backwards like toward the head of the tent or you'll slide to either sides and uh, that's not comfortable. And so these guys that... Uh, I always take with me they they prefer their tents and they're always complaining about that whereas when i just take my floorless shelters it's never really a problem for me i can kind of go anywhere they'll pitch anywhere well let's talk about the pros and cons of tarps tarps are just sheets right just a sheet of material and uh, they're very lightweight and versatile that's a that's one of the pros. They pack down to nothing. And they're very versatile. You can... I was out uh, during a winter storm uh, not too awful long ago. And I had taken a teepee shelter. I got out there and I kind of regretted it. Because I said to myself, if I had if I'd brought a tarp instead, I could go down over the side of this hill and pitch this thing right off the side of the hill and be down next to this creek or this stream and have my water right there all night long. But because uh, of the type of shelter I had chosen for that experience, I was kind of, I kind of had to be at the top of this mountain and I couldn't be down by the water where I wanted to be. So that's a real pro of tarps is that they're so versatile. You can pitch them anywhere with trees, without trees. Uh, there's ways to do it. They provide a lot of flexibility and shelter configuration. You might have seen the videos of these guys showing you different ways. Now, some of them, well, we'll get into the cons here in a minute. Another pro is that they offer great ventilation. They probably offer the greatest ventilation that is possible in a shelter. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I would say that. I, the, the thing I'm thinking about, like a natural shelter that you'd build, like a lean-to or something like that, is that the materials of that 
the wood and the debris and stuff that you would use to build a natural shelter. Uh, it doesn't accumulate moisture the same way that like a, a, a man-made tarp does. So you, you, you don't even know that there's condensation there most of the time. Tarps can be pitched in various ways depending on ver- when weather conditions. You can pitch, for example, a tarp in like the typical old uh, Boy Scout <laughs> tent configuration. Uh, you can drop one side, have one side open. You can do the plow point. You can turn it against the wind, which I think is mostly, uh, uh, I think that's mostly a ridiculous concept because if you're dealing with serious wind, the wind is coming from all directions. Yeah. You, you hear these, these quote unquote bushcrafters talking about pitching their tarp against the wind, but that's, that's just a breeze. That's just a breeze because in any type of real wind, the wind is swirling around everywhere. So there is no pitching it against the wind when it's when the wind is swirling around everywhere. Um, tarps are typically less expensive compared to backpack and tents. In fact, you can go on Amazon, you can find tarps for <laughs> 30 bucks. I've seen them. And it's not bad quality. It's just... You know, the, the more you pay for a tarp, typically the more tie-out points you'll get and stuff like that, and the lighter the tarp will be, and made out of ripstop or not made out of ripstop and things of that nature. All right, let's talk about some of the cons of tarps. Time. Time is a serious con when it comes to tarps. It takes a lot more time and effort every time you want to pitch one effectively. And think about foul weather. It's raining, it's storming, the wind is blowing all over creation, uh, and you have brought a tarp as your shelter. That can be uh, frustrating. Uh, that can be a, an exercise in patience <laughs> uh, to pitch a tarp in any serious wind or rain. Whereas, you know, if you've got a, a tent, uh, even if it's pouring, you can typically get that thing down, and get it up real quick, uh, before things get too wet. But with a tarp, you're getting soaked the whole time you're trying to pitch that thing. On the other hand, for for a tarp, the takedown is usually a breeze, ain't it? Just untie your ridge line and stuff that thing away. Usually. Usually. Another con of tarps is that uh, they offer less protection from elements compared to tents. This, uh, you know, I see the, the the plow point configuration for a tarp is awfully popular among bushcrafters. But, you know, I would argue that um, most bushcrafters are more interested in how something looks. Hate to say it, but fellers, I got I got to call it like it is. It seems to me like most bushcrafters on the internet are more interested in how things look. Than how effective they are because a plow point pitch is not very effective not in any serious weather not in any serious storm or anything like that maybe in a sprinkle they're fine maybe in a situation where there's absolutely no wind they're fine they look great but are they that practical not really they don't offer very much protection and, you know, the last thing you want to do is get your insulation wet. Well, what's your insulation? That's the things you're going to be covering up with at night. So if you're in any situation where getting your blankets soaking wet could result in your death, uh, you're not going to pitch a plow point or any type of tarp setup where rain and wind is going to blow in from the sides. Because that's what weather does in real life. It blows in. So you would need an awfully large tarp to provide enough space under it where that's not going to happen. Like the the rain and wind blowing in from the sides aren't going to affect you underneath the tarp. Tarps offer limited privacy and security. I don't know that, that, you know, again, I think that's more like uh, an emotional thing this idea of security because I don't think they offer less 
security. I think they'd offer more security because if there's any need for you to jump up and get out of there, you can under a tarp. But some people feel like it offers them less security. These are the same people who are afraid of bugs. Not a lot of insulation in cold weather. Um, I, I think that's an iffy, but it, you know it's something that people think about. Minimal insul insulation in cold weather. It, once it gets cold enough, that little fabric of like a sill nylon tent, even if you're enclosed in it, that's not providing much insulation. Your, the heat from your breath, your body, it might, you know, it traps it in there a little bit. But again, any wind whatsoever is just going to take that out. So the idea that an enclosed tent <laughs> offers you a whole lot more insulation in freezing cold weather than just having like a, a tarp that's open on one side or both sides, I think is kind of a, a fantastical notion. But, you know, that's, that would be some people's argument. Let's talk, talk about natural shelters now. Pros and cons of natural shelters. Well, <clears throat> they don't cost anything. Everything you need is just there in whatever environment you're in, right? Because you're just using rocks or you're using sticks or you're using trees or you're using leaves or you're using things like that to, to create your shelter. A cave, you know, is a natural shelter. Another pro is that uh, they provide pretty good protection from the elements, it depends on the materials that are available, but and and it depends on your knowledge of uh, how to do something like that. Another pro is that they blend in real well with the environment. It's not like some kind of bright orange rain fly, right? That's going to call attention to you. Uh, it's just logs and leaves and things like that, and blends in perfectly. Um, another pro with natural shelters is that they can be supplemented so in my bug out bag i've included a rain poncho and i've thought and this is a rain poncho that has grommets i've thought i could either pitch that on its own completely on its own as a lean to which again isn't going to offer perfect coverage this is not going to do me much good in a in a real foul weather but it's a possibility, right? It will keep some of the weather off of me. But it can also, I can supplement that with any natural shelter that I might have to build in the woods. So I could build a lean-to, throw the debris up on top of it there, and even drape my poncho over top of that lean-to and put debris on top of the poncho. And, of course, that's going to keep rain out. Another pro is that... Uh, you know, it does offer, natural shelters do offer you a unique experience. You feel like you're closer to nature. They're more fun, right? It's, it's, a, it's a fun thing to do. Let's talk about the cons of a natural shelter. It relies on finding suitable natural materials and terrain. It requires time and effort. Usually a lot of time and effort. These fancy-pantsy things you see on the Internet are not real world. Those are not real world. Uh, if you're in a, a survival situation or a bug-out situation, you, you are not going to have the time or the energy or the calories to stand around constructing something like that that takes hours or days or even weeks. These under-the-ground things. These things made out of chopping down live trees and building fencing and, and all these things. These reflector shields the, for the campfire that doesn't work. You know, I've explained to you that they don't work. Stone reflector shields work because they absorb the heat and then radiate the heat back out from the fire. But these wooden heat reflectors that you see for campfires, it's all show. They, they they don't work. And none of these really fancy, elaborate shelters, bushcraft, quote-unquote, shelters, are realistic for any real-world scenario. Another con, uh, for those of you who are scared of bugs, you know, you're not going to keep bugs out. In fact, you're probably... They're probably in the wood and everything that you're using to, to create the shelter. They're not transportable. That's another con. 
and they're no good for anybody who wants to be mobile. So they're no good for travel. So back to this guy who was mocking me for reference in the movie World War Z with Brad Pitt. When I was talking about the importance of mobility in any philosophy that involves real-world conditions in woods, right? If you own the property where you're going out and doing these things, you're not traveling on foot any, any distance at all, which means you're never really in need of anything because you can just head back to your house, which is right over the hill. You go back to the house, you get what you need, you go right back down the woods, you're there in 10 minutes. So none of this reflects any real-world conditions that almost always involve travel, mobility. So something that you could carry and would carry two miles back into the woods on your own property is, is not in any way reflective of what's practical for another person who's traveling 30 miles on foot through the wilderness, is it? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. So you hear these guys, oh, weight doesn't bother me, it doesn't bother me. No, it doesn't bother you. We know it doesn't bother you because you're only stepping down into the woods 50 yards to film these videos. But come with me. Come with me on one of my excursions, and you bring all that stuff that you're showing off to everybody and saying that the weight doesn't bother you. You come with me on one of my excursions, and let's see if it doesn't bother you. The foods you're cooking, bring those along. These foods that you're cooking for these videos, bring those along. Come with me on a real excursion into the real woods, and let's see if the weight doesn't bother you. Let's see if they don't spoil and go bad. Let's see if you don't have trouble keeping them from spoiling and going bad. You know, sea salt, like rock sea salt. You see them cooking with rock sea salt. And fresh, juicy steak. Well, how, how do they keep that thing fresh for that video? I'll tell you how they kept it fresh for that video. They pulled it out of the refrigerator five minutes ago. You know, fresh lush fresh vegetables H how did that happen you know they're using uh we call them mangoes uh what, what's the rest of the world call them uh bell peppers fresh brilliant bell peppers they're cutting up on a you know a 10 pound cutting board how did you carry the, the cutting board there how did you fit that into your pack how did you carry that weight and you know the cast iron skillet and uh, the, uh, the mango, the bell pepper, without damaging the bell pepper, and, and it's completely fresh, and you're cooking that up with meat, got fresh full onion there. It's not beat up or bruised or anything. H how did you do that? You did that because you didn't have to travel anywhere. You, you didn't go anywhere on foot. You weren't carrying that stuff on your back for any length of time. That's how you did it. But that does not reflect real-world conditions for you and me, folks. Because when I'm cooking in the woods, I'm miles back there. I had to get back there on foot. These are the real-world conditions. How about like in a, a bug-out bag situation? Again, you're going to want to have a bag that you can grab and take off and have what you need in that bag. So if you're watching these guys who are building these shelters and these elaborate shelters and cooking these elaborate meals in the woods and you think that you're, you wanna implement that thinking into your bug out bag, you're out of your mind. Th these are incompatible things. Um, the guy mocking me about mobility. His argument is he's gonna hold up inside his bunker with a machine gun or something like that and just shoot anybody that comes around and he's going to be fine and everything and he's just going to survive in one place. A system built primarily around the idea of staying in one place is idiotic. 
Now, notice I didn't say that it can't form a part of your preparedness strategy. It's part of my preparedness strategy. What if I am able to stay right here at my house? Well, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Because I can stock my basement with all kinds of canned foods, water, cots, wool blankets, all this stuff where weight is not an issue. It does form part of my philosophy toward preparedness. But a system built primarily around that idea of staying in one place is idiotic. Here are some recent examples of natural disasters where mobility and evacuation were crucial for people's safety. Now keep in mind, these are natural disasters. Wildfires in California, here in the United States, 2020 to 2021. In recent years, California has experienced devastating wildfires, forcing thousands of residents to evacuate their homes at a moment's notice. Rapidly spreading fires, fueled by dry conditions and strong winds, have necessitated swift and strategic evacuations to ensure people's safety. Imagine you're a person in that situation and your whole strategy for preparedness has been to remain in one place. Well, you're kind of up the creek without a paddle, ain't you? Hurricane Dorian in 2019 was a powerful Category 5 hurricane that struck the Bahamas and parts of the southeastern United States. As the storm approached, residents in its path had to evacuate low-lying areas and coastal regions to seek higher ground and safer shelter. Again, your whole strategy is built on, I'm going to just hunker down here with a machine gun and keep people away from my supply of food, right? Well, you're up a creek without a paddle. Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. Typhoon Haiyan, one of the strongest tropical cyclones ever recorded. Devastated the Philippines, caused widespread destruction and loss of life. Many residents had to flee their homes and seek refuge in evacuation centers or move to safer locations as the storm approached. What do you think? Hunkering down in one place? Does that sound very smart to you, Mr. Guy out there who was mocking me? Number four, flooding in Kerala, India. 2018, severe flooding resulted in widespread displacement of residents as rivers overflowed and landslides occurred. Many people had to evacuate their homes and move to relief camps set up by the government. Do you want to rely on the government? Well, maybe you do. I would rather have prepared myself a a bug out bag, which keeps me independent and uh, self-sufficient and not have to rely entirely on other people. So they had to do that or they had to seek shelter with relatives in other safer areas. Again, it's nice to have relatives to go to, but I I like to stay as self-sufficient as possible. How about the earthquakes in Haiti in 2010 and Nepal in 2015? Both Haiti and Nepal experienced devastating earthquakes that caused widespread destruction and loss of life. In the aftermath of these disasters, Many survivors had to leave their homes due to collapsed buildings, unsafe structures, and the threat of aftershocks, necessitating evacuation to safer areas. In each of these instances, folks, mobility and the ability to evacuate quickly and efficiently were critical for these people to avoid harm and seek safety from the immediate dangers posed by these natural disasters. What about man-made disasters or crises, 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 such as wars and conflicts? Are we immune to that here in the United States? Well, you'd like to think so, but we ain't. In fact, isn't preparedness preparing for any eventuality or any possible eventuality? Here's some recent examples. The Syrian Civil War, 2011 to present. 
The ongoing conflict in Syria has resulted in millions of people being displaced within the country and across borders. Civilians have had to flee their homes due to violence, bombings, and the threat of persecution, seeking refuge in safer areas or neighboring countries. How many of you, how many of them do you think said, nope, nope, I'm going to hunker down. I'm going to hunker down and just keep everybody away from me. How safe do you think that they were compared to the people who were able to just grab something and take off? Of course they're not safer. It's an absurd concept. The Yemeni Civil War, 2015 to present. The Civil War in Yemen has caused widespread displacement. Many Yemens forced to flee their homes due to our airstrikes, fighting between factions, and the humanitarian crisis resulting from the conflict. Internally displaced persons often seek shelter in overcrowded camps or host communities. Boy, be awfully nice to have prepared for this, <laughs> to be self-sufficient and just be able to go up into the woods and last, last for a while, wouldn't it? The Rohingya crisis, 2017 to present. The persecution of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar has led to a mass exodus of refugees fleeing to neighborhood Bangladesh. Hundreds of thousands have crossed the border to escape violence, persecution, human rights abuses, seeking safety again in overcrowded refugee camps. But they're alive. They're alive. The Iraqi and Afghan wars, which are ongoing. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have resulted in significant population displacement with millions of civilians forced to flee their homes due to violence, bombings, and insurgency. Many have become internally displaced or sought refuge in neighboring countries. How about Venezuela? That's ongoing. The economic and political crisis in Venezuela has led to a large-scale exodus of refugees and migrants fleeing the country in search of better opportunities and safety. Venezuelans have crossed borders into neighboring countries such as Colombia and Brazil, often on foot or by makeshift means of transportation. In man-made disasters or crises like wars, mobility is often driven by the need to escape violence, persecution, or dire living conditions. People may undertake perilous journeys, often with limited resources and support in search of safety, shelter, and a better future for themselves and their families. And there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Those are, those are just two things, right? Natural disasters and man-caused conflict. So I'll say it again. If anything you're watching on the Internet is propagandizing you to believe that you're going to be safer staying in one place and putting all your eggs into that basket and that you there's no need for you to consider the possibility that you might have to walk long distances on foot and have necessities with you on your person that you can transport in a mobile way. Um, you're... You're wasting your time on that fiction. That is fiction entertainment because it's not based in real life. Okay, there's one last shelter type that I want to talk about. I have alluded to it quite a bit. I've mentioned it quite a bit in this episode, uh, but it's my personal favorite, and it's these TP tarp tents like this black diamond megalite I was telling you about. Um, I'll tell you, one of the primary reasons why I like it so much is because if you're taking a tarp, which I love the tarps. They're so simple. Uh, they're, you know, they're, you can use them anywhere. Uh, they're really uh, flexible as far as their, their uses. Um, but the tarp typically, in order to pitch it in a way that you're mostly enclosed from weather and protected from weather, uh, you got to get real creative with like the pitching style, which can take a lot of time, a lot of adjustments. So this, you know, this is not conducive to like real bad weather conditions. 
Whereas these TP style, like sill nylon tarp tents, completely enclose you, protect you from the outside elements. There are no open parts. You've got zipping doors and stuff like that and air vents that are pre-built into these things. There is nothing easier to pitch. You throw them down, you stake the corners, and then a pole goes up the center. And voila, you've got your shelter and you're perfectly enclosed in this thing. I mean, except for the floor. Because I'm doing this with floorless versions of these things. But I'm talking about overhead and to the sides. There's no uh, wind hitting you right from the sides. There's no uh, rain blowing in on you and things of that nature. Uh, another really fantastic part of these uh, TP style tarp tents is that that form factor is probably the most robust in all sorts of weather. It will take all sorts of weather. Just the way that TP form factor uh, handles weather probably better than any other type of shelter. So you just can't beat them with a club. They're so easy to pitch. They're so simple. They're so effective. I, I just think they're the, the bee's knees myself. They also offer all kinds of uh, space on the inside. So for the same weight in like an ultralight one-person backpacking tent, you can get the, enough space on the inside for like four grown men. Think about all you can do inside there if, if you're just one person one person with his dogs or something. You can do everything in there. Like I've told, like I mentioned earlier, I've had it start to storm on me and I've taken like these full foldable uh, backpacking chairs, just pulled them right inside with me. I, I don't have to, to worry about disassembling them or anything like that. I just throw everything inside and then I jump in myself and I've still got plenty of room in there. I've even cooked in them. Now, you want to make sure if you're cooking in there with like a canister stove or something like that, you've got all the vents opened and you may, you want to take care. You don't want to turn that flame up too high or anything like that because you don't want to wake up dead from carbon monoxide poisoning. So in my personal considerations of these things, I've said to myself, well, why carry a tarp, which requires tons of work to set up and pitch and usually has sides opened and exposed to the outside? When you can carry a TP tarp shelter that's made from the same stuff, weighs about the same, but completely encloses you all the way around. A floorless TP tarp shelter offers lots of benefits. I think it offers the most benefits of any other option as far as a transportable mobile shelter system goes. They're lightweight. They're made out of these lightweight materials like sil nylon are fantastic. Easy to carry in a backpack, pack down super small. They're great for emergency bags or, you know, bug out bags. Versatility. They can be set up almost anywhere. So there's a lot of flexibility as far as like where you're going to put one down on different terrain and in different weather conditions and those sorts of things. Spaciousness, I've already mentioned. Absence of a floor provides huge spacious interior. Multiple occupants. Plenty of gear on the inside without feeling cramped. They offer fantastic ventilation because they don't have a floor to trap heat and moisture. You know, it's not like you're in a, a sandwich bag. They just breathe really, really well. They con Condensation, although you still deal with it is not as big of a problem. You know, because uh, it, they're floorless, you feel closer to nature. And the ground is right there. By the way, when I was growing up, I had people that I went to school with, they didn't, have, they didn't have floors in their houses. The floors in their houses in Appalachia were, was the ground. So this is not too strange for me. I, I don't know why it's so strange for so many people, the idea of not being protected from the ground. The ground is your friend. And again, I, I think it goes back to this uh, irrational fear of bugs. I've talked about how easy they are to set up. Throw it down, stake some to the sides, and a stick up the middle, and you're set. 
How do you, you, you cannot find an easier setup than that. How about adaptability? Floorless shelters like these TP style floorless shelters can accommodate campfires, cooking stoves inside, and they provide warmth. The ability to prepare meals inside, even in terrible weather. You know, if you've seen them with stove jacks and stuff like that, I, I, that's a little. Uh, I haven't done something like that yet. I have one with a stove jack built into it. Um, I just haven't pulled the trigger on buying a wood stove. And I'll tell you why. Because of this mobility thing. If I'm actually out in the backcountry, I'm not spending a, a week in one place. I'm moving in a direction, right? I have a, a destination that I'm moving toward. And, so, and I'm on a schedule. So it's not like I can just set up a camp and just sit there for four days and then kind of willy-nilly pack down and travel a little bit and spend a few more days at this new location. No, I, I got to keep moving. That's the real nature of these things. You know, you guys work. I work. We've got people that we're responsible to and for. and So... It's not like you can just go out into the mountains and disappear and you don't have any reason to come back to civilization. So with a, a wood stove, that would require, you know, a lot of work to set up and everything. And then say you got that comfort for a night. Well, the next day you got to wait for the, the thing to cool down. You got to clean all that out, pack down those stove pipes, pack down the stove. Uh, it, it, it adds a lot of things to the whole formula. Whereas if my heat system or my uh, insulation system depends on just like my insulation, my blankets, the way I'm dressed, and, and those sorts of things, uh, then I don't have to deal with all that unnecessary stuff of like a wood stove. So I'm not saying I'll never try it, um, but I just ain't done it yet. Weight savings. You omit the floor, TP tarps are lighter than most traditional tents. So they're fantastic. Uh, they're cost effective. This one, like I said, this Black Diamond, when I bought it 15 years ago, it was kind of like cutting edge or something. So it, it cost me a lot. But you can find them today uh, for a fraction of the price that I paid for this Black Diamond Megalite. So floorless TP tarp shelters. Give them, a, give them a, some consideration. Uh, this... Black Diamond Megalite that I'm showing folks on the camera has the tent stakes in there. The only thing it needs, like if I, if I were to have this in a bug out bag or an emergency bag, the only thing I would have to do was go, it would be to go into the woods and either find or cut myself a center pole. And then I've got a shelter for four people. Easy. And a dog or even dogs. So, something to consider. And, folks, uh, I was going to tell a campfire story. We don't have time. I apologize. The show's already going over time. And so, I will save that campfire story for the next episode of the Practical Woodsman podcast. And I hope that you'll join me for that next episode. I've appreciated having you here as an audience for this episode. You guys all take care. Do something nice for yourselves and uh, you know, try to get out into the woods and have some fun. Talk to you guys later.